comes in to talk with us about, uh, oh yeah, comes back to talk with us about oil, gas, the budgets, and more. <laughs> we're uh, we're only going to talk about oil and gas today, though, and budgets and more. Brad Keithley <laughs> joins us this morning. <laughs> morning, sir. How are you? <laughs> Michael, I'm doing great. I, yeah, we need to be careful on the end more. I was just talking to Eric, Eric over the break, and I said, "Look, if we're going to get off into the into the fiscals of marijuana, that's his expertise, not mine." Oh, that's uh, and, right. and, oh so if you want to get off into the weeds, we have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, I'll, I'll be the whipping boy here. It's okay. You'll be the. That's all right. We'll be we'll be down on him a little bit. It'll be fine. Uh, let's talk a little bit about. <laughs> Now, the session's over. Everything's done. Uh, nothing happened, which I think was, again, probably the best uh, the best uh, uh, solution or the best outcome of what's, uh, what's going on. Now we've got another few weeks to kind of get things ready for the next special session. But we've got some things on the plate here that we want to talk about this morning, including um, – you know this the the big the big bull in the room is the uh, is the uh, the AKLNG project with China. That's what the governor's touting. That's what he's putting as a feather in his cap going into the next election cycle. But there's still some questions about it. And we saw some of the metrics that came out talking about 75 percent of the take would go to the Chinese as part of their their payments and and everything else. Let's talk about some of the details on this and see if it's good, if it's bad. What are your thoughts on the uh, AKLNG deal with China? Well, let's let's start with the good parts. Um, China China is is was always going to be a big part of this project, right? It, if we're doing if we're doing an LNG project in the Pacific Rim, uh, and we're targeting uh, LNG markets in the Pacific Rim, China was always going to be a big part of it. Japan is a historic LNG user. Korea is a historic LNG user. Taiwan, Taiwan are, is, is a historic LNG user. And those were always, you know, in the mix. But they're, you know, they've been tied into long-term projects from elsewhere in the world, uh, and it was going to be hard to break into those. What you really need to make the LNG, the Alaska LNG project work is a big market, sort of a, 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 a limitless market in a way, um, in a new area that hasn't been tied in traditionally to other projects. And China is is it. That is the that is sort of the the, the target market for everybody. Having a government to government relationship between the Alaska government and the Chinese government is a big positive deal. Uh, and and the type of while, while the agreement is pretty thin that they signed while over in China, the outline uh, of that agreement contemplates a uh, contemplates a, a deal that that would significantly tie China into the success of the Alaska LNG project if that deal comes to fruition. So that's a positive. I mean, we we we've we've advanced. Um, a relationship with our with with the biggest target market we possibly could have, um, and we've advanced it significantly in terms of in terms of a government to government relationship, in terms of private um, what passes for private corporations uh, in uh, in China uh, involvement in it, in terms of Sinopec, a, a, a oil company, a, somebody somebody who knows the industry, somebody who knows what they're getting into. Uh, and two Chinese uh, financial institutions that that are going to play roles in this that I that I would play roles in this that I think are very important. So I think I think that is a positive. And and you know whether we give credit to the governor or, or we give credit to to you know other things that I think is a positive. But there are there are some pretty serious questions uh, left uh, left left remaining. The economics of this deal, if you look at um, uh, President Meyer's uh, presentation to the RDC, RDC and you look at other presentations that AGDC, Alaska Gas Line Development Corporation, have made, the economics of this are incredibly um, uh, tight. All of the presentations that I've seen come out of AGDC are now predicated on a $43 billion construction cost. That's at the low end construction cost for the for the pipeline, the kit that's necessary to gasify uh, the the liquefy the the, the gas. Um, that is at the low end 
of the spectrum, very low end of the spectrum that had been come to, that had been uh, developed uh, when the producers were still involved in the project. And that cost estimate was done at a time when the industry, frankly, was on a downtick. Uh, industry development was on a downtick. Uh, activities, industry activities were on a downtick. And so supply costs, the cost of construction contractors and that sort of stuff, uh, were, were relatively low. Um, to achieve that $43 billion, you've got to have somebody running this project that knows exactly what they're doing, exactly how to put these types of projects together, are going to be able to achieve very low costs with, uh, with pipe suppliers and with construction contractors to deliver a, a project in that range. Um, and if you if that cost blows out, even by a little, let's say it just blows out by 10 percent, right. the economics the economics of the project uh, change dramatically. So it's there. There's there's a good thing about this. The tie to the Chinese you cannot deny the tie to the Chinese is a is a strong point. But the type of economics we're seeing coming out of AGDC. Make this make this a very 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 tight project uh, to achieve. And the numbers that you're seeing so far, and again, we're not seeing many of the details. They're saying that we won't really see a lot of these details until, I guess, the end of 2018. The real finite, the down on the weeds numbers. But the the overall numbers that we're seeing so far are they positive? Are they are they uh, are they a plus? I mean, we're seeing seventy five percent of the gas could be sold to China. Alaska will retain twenty five percent. That that seems like a lot, but is that in line with what other kind you know other deals that have been made you know across the world? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, Alaska doesn't consume a lot of gas. I it it we. We think we do, and then Cook Inlet, we've got most of the residentials and commercials hooked up to gas. But in the big scheme of things, Alaska doesn't consume a lot of gas. So retaining 25%, um, we're still going to have to find export markets for, for that 25% that, that Alaska has retained um, in the capacity. We're still going to have to sign more deals to do that. But the, the Alaska consumption, I'm, I'm not sure I've done it recently on percentage, but it's not five, it's not even 5%. Of the line, it's probably two percent, three percent of right. the capacity of the line. So, so yeah, that's 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 more than enough. In fact, it may be. I mean, if we have to go find twenty-five percent of the of of the capacity uh, outside of China, uh, if China is going to absorb seventy-five percent, we have to find twenty-five percent. We're still we're still going to be pressed for markets. He, here's where the rub comes in, though. The rub comes in on the on the resource side. So the way this deal is structured, it is a delivered price, basically the assumption of a delivered price in China, uh, less shipping costs, less uh, the cost of building the liquefaction plant uh, at Nikiski, less the pipeline cost, and then you get to the resource. And and what you what you call that in the industry is a net back, um, uh, a net back look at economics. And the net back to the to the resource is a dollar. Um, a dollar in MMBTU. If the construction cost blows, the way this deal looks like it's set up, if the construction cost ends up higher than $43 billion, or if the market price ends up lower than, than the assumption of $8, that's going to be netted back to the resource. And so instead of a dollar, it's going to be $0.80, cents, or it's going to be $0.60, cents, or it's going to be something something lower than that. That's where Alaska... Uh, long term, that's where Alaska gets its payoff here. It's not going to get right. the payoff. The construction jobs will be nice, but they'll be a blip. I mean, they'll we'll, we'll sort of look back on it at some point. Well, those who are here, those who are still alive, will look back at it on some point as as the same sort of construction blip we had during taps. It's not a long term. It's not a long term impact on the state. The investment in the pipeline. I mean, HEDC wants to talk about the return on the investment in the pipeline. But in all honesty, I mean, we, we could get the same thing, you know, investing uh, uh, the same amount of money with uh, alongside the permanent fund in the market and probably right. get a better return. So so that's not the deal. The deal is what's going to go on in the resource um, and whether we're getting whether we're getting a good net back out of the resource. A buck 
is pretty thin. The dollar is pretty thin, particularly when you consider that as much gas as we found on the slope, as much gas as there is in Prudhoe um, and in uh, Point Thompson, that's only half the supply we need for a 40-year deal, a 40-year offtake uh, through the LNG facility, which most people have assumed is the life. So you're going to have you're, you're going to you're going to be saying to people who are who you want to go out and develop additional gas resources, you're going to get a buck. Um, well, and, and that, that's, that pretty raises, thin. that's pretty thin. Yeah, well, I'll say this. It, that raises my question on whether or not the producers would actually be even, you know, at a buck, would they be even required to sell it? I mean, would they be like, no, nah, that, I mean, that just, you know, it, it comes back now to uh, if you build it, they have to sell it. But at a buck, do they have to sell it? Does that even, does that even noodle out for them? <laughs> Well, it's I, when you've got Prudhoe and you've got Point Thompson, you've got existing resources found that are largely uh, 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 covered by existing infrastructure. Prudhoe much more than Point Thompson, but Point Thompson still has the pipeline over. Um, you, you're, you're getting in the range where probably you're covering their costs for producing those existing those existing resources. But what you don't have, and this and this is the focus that that really has not had a lot of a lot of attention to it over time because we've sort of been trying to get over the first hurdle but but when you focus on the fact that only half the resource for a 40 year life of this project only half the resources in the existing fields yeah we know there's additional gas out there or at least you know the the geologists tell us there's high likelihood there's additional gas out there but you've got to go develop it. You've got to go invest in. The, you got to go, you know, build, drill wells. You've got to go build infrastructure. You got to do all sorts of things to develop it. And a buck, uh, if what you're getting out of there is a buck, um, uh, nobody's under an obligation to go drill additional wells. Nobody's under an obligation to go make additional investment out there. So yeah, you might get. You might that might be enough to justify getting the existing producers to produce. Um, but it, but it may not be enough to getting to getting the exploration activity out there. You need to get the other half of the supply, and if you don't get that other half of the supply, what happens is is all these financial expectations built upon a 40-year life of the project or longer just just disappear because because you've only got a gas supply that's only that's only half that length. So right. so the resource side the resource side of this. Um, is is really where a lot of focus needs to be, and we talked last week about bringing the producers back into back in this discussion um, uh, and, and, and as an important step. We absolutely need to do that. We need to know not only the, our existing producers, but also uh, producers that that we have some expectation. Uh, maybe may lead the effort to go out and develop develop additional supplies. They need to be part of this part of this discussion, and and we need them. Alaska needs them as part of that discussion because, frankly, that's where our money is. That's where Alaska's money is over the long term on this deal, and we need to, we need their verification that not only is that a good is that is that net back scheme going to work um, uh, to develop supply, but to, to develop existing supply. But it's going to work long term to provide the incentive for the additional exploration that needs to take place to develop the other half of the supply we need. Um, let's talk for just a second. Harold sent me a message over Facebook at facebook.com slash Michael Duke show. And he says uh, that, you know, let's talk about the numbers as far as the the monies of mortgage and things like that. Three point five billion dollars in annual mortgage costs. Only $1.2 billion in revenue with 25% left over to market into a buyer's market. That th Those numbers don't seem to pencil out. Well, they do when you got the Chinese on for 70, 75% on the hook for 75% of the construction costs. You can, you can make the numbers work, as, as I've been discussing. If you assume a $43 billion construction cost and you assume the Chinese have 75% percent of the capacity and they're paying the debt on 75 they're paying the cost for 75 percent of the uh of the construction um and you're and you assume a 20-year life on that debt and you assume that pays out 75 percent of the cost all of that works at 43 billion dollars but what it gives you is that dollar net back so you're very very sensitive 
to the question of A, whether that dollar net back works, or and B, whether the true number of the, the true construction cost number is $43 billion. If either of those don't work, if it's not $43 billion uh, and, and or a dollar net back doesn't work, the economics of this explode. But if both of those are true, then the economics, they're thin, uh, but, they, but they work. The bigger problem Michael? here with that is, is the time frame. Uh, you know, the bigger problem, because they if it's so thin and the problem is, is that this is a long term project where it takes five, six, eight years for it to be constructed, 10 years for it to be constructed. If they change over the course of those eight years, it could be go it could go from profitable in year two or three to completely unprofitable or, you know, the numbers just blowing up in year eight. That is the law. Again, I like your idea of just take that money and invest it alongside the permanent fund and you'll get a greater rate of return. Yeah, it's um, um, I mean, we, we've got we've got a resource up there. We've got gas up there and and monetizing it would be good for the state. And and finding a way to monetize it is certainly something that is that's that's very useful. Um, and would and would help uh, in our current in in our long term fiscal situation, but you're exactly right. We've got to be careful. The, the way you the way you accommodate um, uh, those sorts of risks over time that uh, that the price might change in the market is you enter into long term contracts and you hedge and you do a bunch of things that that producers and 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 customers have become very adept at uh, over the last decade. Uh, as markets have 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 fluctuated up and down, and as as the LNG market has loosened up, that doesn't bother me uh, as much. Those risks don't bother me. The two risks that that bother me, looking at it from an oil and gas perspective, uh, the two risks that bother me a lot are the risk, the the construction cost risk that you really can't hedge much, um, and the uh, and the resource. All right, we're running late. We just finished talking about. Uh the uh, the LNG line and the Chinese deal, but I want to move on a little bit now into some of the things that we're seeing on the national scale uh, and how it uh, how it affects or how it portends what's going on inside the state of Alaska, specifically the tax plan, the Republican tax plan in Congress, of course, facing some scrutiny right now. This debate is getting a little bit heated, but it's showing us some things uh, that kind of reflect on what's happening in Alaska. Brad Keithley continues with us now to discuss it. Brad. Well, a couple of things about the tax debate. One, I need to say quickly that that we've got to be supportive. <laughs> we've got to be supportive of, the, of a final tax bill here because that's where Anwar, that's where the Anwar opening has gotten has gotten tagged onto. Um, so, in the budget in the budget committee today, they'll bring the Anwar bill that was uh, that, that that went through Lisa Murkowski's committee, the opening of Anwar, the leasing of Anwar. We'll bring it and connect it to the tax bill. That's how they're going to try to pass ANWR uh, as including it as part of the tax bill. So it's important that we have success with the tax bill because that's where the ANWR opening is. And as we were just talking about a moment ago, we need additional exploration for the long term in this state. And ANWR, uh, a lot of people think, has has an, is an opportunity. So uh, opening up is opening up is a, opening it up is a good thing. But that having been said, I think I think the what's happening with the tax the, the guts of the tax bill in Washington uh, looks something like what we've been going through here uh, with uh, with the PFD tax and other things that we've been talking about uh, in, in Alaska. The the tax bill in Washington started out strong in terms of the focus on the impact on middle income families. Middle-income families are important because they spend a lot, uh, a lot more as a percent of their uh, of, of, of their income um, into the local economy, uh, and 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 you worry about middle-income families not only because they're uh, because they're a big voting block, but also because they're economically important to uh, to the economy. So you worry about the impact on middle-income families. Uh, we started out with that focus in the federal tax bill started out with that focus but over the last couple of weeks you could you can you can see that sliding away <clears throat> what what's happened is there's been much more focus on 
uh, on corporate, uh, the, the taxes as it relates to corporations and, and businesses, uh, and uh, how it affects uh, wealthy, uh, wealthy Americans. And the, and, the, and the previous focus on the middle income has, has sort of slidden, slid down the list of priorities as, as sort of getting any tax bill has uh, has has risen to the to the top of the top of the heap, and in order to get marginal senators senators that the Republicans need to pass the bill, they've started uh, making adjustments to the bill that 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 increases its act- attractiveness to this senator or that senator, this senator or that senator is responding to his donor base, his group of contributors, and right. it's ha- it's having the effect of moving the bill. More and more toward the toward benefiting the wealthy and and corporations, we see the same thing in Alaska, particularly on the Senate side, but also on the state Senate side, but also on the state House side, with PFD cuts. Right, PFD right. cuts, at, according to ICER, have the by far have the largest adverse impact on Alaska families, middle income families, uh, and have by far uh, are the are the worst, have the greatest adverse effect, largest adverse effect. Uh, on the overall economy, uh, but nonetheless, in Alaska, we've seen the same thing we're seeing at the federal level. We've seen uh, the, the higher income levels uh, uh, have more in, uh, more influence on the process uh, than worrying about uh, middle income families or the overall economy. And we've seen the Senate uh, and the House, to a large degree, adopt fiscal fiscal measures that are heavily weighted toward PFD cuts. The Senate's exclusively, the House is, is, is predominantly a PFD cut driven approach that, that favor wealthy, uh, the wealthier uh, upper income classes um, and adversely affect the middle income classes, lower income classes, and adversely, because of that, adversely affect the overall economy. So it's, it's, it's interesting to watch what's going on in DC because it, it is it is increasingly replicated what we've seen go on go on in Alaska, which is the starting point. Yes, we're concerned about middle income families. Yes, we're concerned about the overall economy, and also at the federal level. Yes, we're concerned about the deficit. But as you get into the details, you see that sliding away as people respond to their donor base, and you see it becoming more and more tilted toward uh, the upper income classes. To the point where, if you, when you look out 10 years, uh, at least at, uh, by some analyses of the federal of, of what we now see as the federal tax uh, approach, the Senate's approach, uh, you see you know, middle income, uh, the middle in, uh, middle income taxpayers paying more uh, under the Senate's approach uh, than uh, than they are currently. So it's it, it, there's a lesson here uh, in terms of in terms of Alaska. We've We've been going down a bad road in terms of adopting a, a fiscal measures that adversely affect middle class uh, Alaskans, adversely affect the, the Alaska economy. We're now seeing that beginning to be replicated uh, as we get deeper into the tax debate on the federal side. Well, and I think we're seeing also uh, kind of a, a, a you know a, a, an example being set by the national uh, uh, Congress. Uh, again, this uh, idea that we can just continue to spend now the Congress can print their own money. I mean, they essentially can deficit spend as much as they want. The Alaskan legislature has done the same thing, only we have a finite amount because we have a savings. We had the the constitutional budget reserve and the earnings reserve, and they but they've just been following that same kind of example of we'll just spend whatever we feel like we need and we won't cut it back now that that reckoning is about to come due because there's just not going to be enough to make it happen and so there's going to be a little more desperation in the state to to you know well on their part to find more revenues instead of finding more efficiencies or more cuts but this is again this is a problem that's been going it's not just an alaskan problem look at all the states that are in deficit spending right now it's a it's a national issue uh, and and I think we've got, like I said earlier in the program, we've got way too many cooks in the soup on all these tax plans and the budget issues. There are way too many special interests, and that's the problem we're facing in America today. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, you, you're seeing the special interest push back on the federal tax bill in terms of, well, you know, tax that other guy, Russell Long, who used to be a long-term sen- a longtime senator from Louisiana back in the day, used to be chair of Senate Finance, uh, had this great saying, said, don't tax me. Don't tax the 
tax that guy behind the tree. And you're seeing a lot of the yeah. special interests coming in uh, in D.C. and saying, well, don't take away my uh, my uh, tax benefit. Don't take away my friend's tax benefit. Go tax that guy behind the tree. Unfortunately, the guy behind the tree tends to be the, 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 the middle income classes. And you're exactly right about – the, uh, about what's going on in Congress in terms of, of you know the deficit spending getting getting behind. Yes, they can print money, but printing more money has consequences in terms of inflation and all sorts of bad effects. So you want to keep you want to keep federal the federal deficit down, um, and 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 they're beginning to lose that focus also to the point um, as they as they cut taxes as they cut future revenues for all of these special interests. Some of it's going back over on the middle class. Some of it's just being left uh, uncovered. And so the deficit, the projected deficit coming out of this tax bill is beginning to rise to the point that one of the proposals on the table today uh, before the, the uh, U.S. Senate Budget Committee is is a provision that would uh, – to put in the bill that would automatically start to increase taxes – if if deficits reach reach a certain level that they're projected to do under the under the way the bill's been written most recently projected to do um in in like five years five six seven and and that's exactly what it, and and the reason for that is they is there's no commitment to reduce spending at the same time to the same extent uh as they're reducing uh as they're reducing the the taxes as they're reducing the revenue side so to keep it within the the Senate budget rules on you can only create so much of a deficit out of out of tax reform, they're they're now putting in a rider uh, that would essentially start to raise taxes again if the deficits uh, get to the get to the projected level. That's I mean, that's that's sort of the equivalent that we're seeing in Alaska. We can't we we don't have the 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 stamina or the resolve in our legislature. Or in our administration to make the additional cuts and spending necessary to get our fiscal house in order. So you're seeing the same sort of thing. You're seeing the PFD tax. Some people call it the PFD cut, but it's the it's 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 the 50 percent assessment on uh, on statutory PFD payments that are otherwise due. Um, you're seeing that in the Senate. You're seeing that plus an income tax in the House because they don't have the resolve to make the spending cuts. Now we're seeing. We're seeing the same thing in Congress as this tax bill goes through. Oh, yeah, well, we're not going to have enough revenue, so I guess we'll just have to put in a tax increase rider uh, uh, in years five and six and beyond uh, to account for the fact that we're not going to be able to control the deficit coming out of this tax bill. Well, and and we see this, and I think you know eventually what's going to have to happen, Brad, is there's not going to be enough. Uh, revenue to to do what these people want. They're going to continue to push it, and we're going to start to see things change. I think the the reduction in the number of students uh, that we're seeing in the school districts, and the, I, I think it's canary in the coal mine. I think we'll see people yep. vote with their feet, and it'll just create a, a cycle of, of of negative reinforcement cycle that'll just continue to change. We're out of time, though. Brad Keithley, thank you so much for coming in. As always, thought provoking discussion. We appreciate it. Michael, thanks for having me. As always. 